Welcome to the Lean Solutions Podcast, where we discuss business solutions to help listeners develop and implement action plans for true lean process improvement. I am your host, Patrick Adams. Hello and welcome to the Lean Solutions Podcast. My guest today is John Willis. John recently served as the Senior Director of the Global Transformation Office at Red Hat. Prior to Red Hat, he was the Director of Ecosystem Development for Docker, which he joined after the company he co-founded was acquired by Docker in February of 2015. John was one of the earliest cloud evangelists and is considered one of the founders of the DevOps movement. John is the author of seven IBM Red Books. He is also the co-author of the DevOps Handbook and Beyond the Phoenix Project. Welcome to the show, John. Hey, Patrick. Great. I'm glad to really, really excited about being on your podcast. So. I'm looking forward to diving in. John, you and I were recently in Japan together with Katie Anderson. Uh, so we got to know each other uh, very well during our trip together. And, and uh, we had some really, really great conversations. I hope to talk a little bit about that trip today on the on the uh, the podcast and uh, just maybe dive into some of our uh, takeaways that that we had together while we were over in Japan. Brilliant. Yep, absolutely. But before we do that, um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about your upcoming book, which we discussed in detail while we were in Japan, um, specifically about Dr. Deming. Uh, but for those that are listening in that may not know who uh, Dr. Deming is, do you mind giving, you know, everyone just kind of a, a maybe a little bit of background, uh, an introduction to Dr. Deming uh, before we dive into a little bit yeah. about your book? And go ahead. It's funny, you know, when you, you write a book, right, one of the things you do through the exercises, I hired a consultant and that you, you, you sort of define a target reader. I sort of broke the rule. I defined three target readers. And one was my mother-in-law. And she reads about two or three books a month, you know, everything from um, historical fiction to a, a lot of romance novels and stuff like that. But she's, a, she's an avid reader. And I thought, what a perfect target for this book because I want people like you to read it and say, wow, that was a great book. And I want my mother-in-law who knows nothing about IT technology, lean, doesn't even know what those words mean. And one of the right. things she said to me after she read the book was, wow, I'm surprised I never heard this guy. And, <laughs> and, so, and, and the story is, you know, the sort of the narrative of his life is incredible. I mean, he, you know, he starts out at the um, the beginning of the second scientific revolution, you know, quantum physics and all that. He's literally getting a degree in mathematical physics in, in, the, in the 20s, 1920s, right? So you imagine all the stuff that's going on there, right? And um, comes out and sort of gravitates to statistics. He's the first person to add sampling to the Census Bureau. So revolutionize mm -hmm. how we do census and literally, First and foremost, even though he was a physicist, the, you know, sort of the literature, he was a musician, um, but but he called himself a statistician. And and he really, in the early days, doesn't get much credit, but really sort of, um, you know, um, defined a lot of the early work in analytical statistics. In fact, defined the, the whole space called analytical statistics. Then um, World War II is, kicks off. And he gets pulled in to um, create some um, improvement training at Stanford. Trains about 3,000 managers. This, this is like the beginning of World War II in how to use factory improvements, statistical process analysis, you know, statistical process control, all these things. The blast radius that is like 30,000. In my book, I have quotes from generals who proclaim that that was one of the reasons we've won the war. Mm. Right. Was this quality? I mean, because if you think about what was going on here, is all the factory workers went off the war, and all of a sudden, the retirees and 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 women are getting forced into a domain they have no expertise in, and so it had right. to be some like almost miraculous program, and and the output of our tanks, our planes, were just our ships were just phenomenally. Um, there's a book by the um, David Havelstein. Um, and I, I cover this in my book too, like when the Japanese would capture the, because they had a, a group of statistical quality analysis people on their side, right? They'd capture mm -hmm. a plane, a US a plane, and they said they'd be sickened by the gap in quality, right? Mm -hmm. So he does that, then he goes and does a bunch of top secret work, working with Norbert Wiener, working, you know, the guy, the father of cybernetics, um, Herbert Simon, 
um, even Claude Shannon, right? And, you know, and um, you know, just basically um, Akoff, if you know, sort of Akoff. These are all people. They're in a top secret program to help figure out like all these sort of radio transmissions, all just tons of things. It's, it's all classified. After the war, MacArthur sets up a rebuilding of Japan. He sends Deming over, and Deming is credited um, in a lot of cases for what they call the miracle in Japan. Mm -hmm. right? And you know, part of my book is I create direct correlations to his impact on Toyota. Mm. And we can talk a little bit about like when I we had the conversation with Yoshino in Katie's book, and he was part of our Japan trip. And I asked him directly what was the impact of Deming. And we talk about that a little. So he does that, right? And then he comes back to the US and they throw all his work out. You know, all the men come back from war, like, what's this stuff? You know, this is nonsense. This is not how you do manufacturing. And then he's literally um living outside of DC as an 80-year-old octogenarian, right? And and um and NBC does this documentary who they accidentally find about some work he's doing with, um, you know, with, with a, a company that's doing a collaboration with a printing company in Japan. They do a documentary called If Japan Can, Why Can't We? And they interview Deming. And then all of America realizes, oh, my God, the reason Japan is, like, decimating us in everything, especially cars, right, Toyota, um, Nissan, and Honda, the uh, the American taught them how to do it. I mean, that's the, the gist of the thing. And so the next thing you know, Ford, the president of Ford calls him and says, come on in. And Demi's like this classic, like, he won't work with you unless, like, the CEO is involved. Mm -hmm. And he's, well, you have to be involved. And Peterson, who's the CEO of Ford at the time, is like, no, oh, I'm the CEO. He's like, he hangs up right. on him. Like, they're like, I have all this, you know, like, I, I try to describe that, like, the book is like, a, a, a really smart uh, Forrest Gump character mm. literally sort of goes through. So it's not a biography. It's sort of like a Michael Lewis, if you ever read Moneyball or, you know, where you don't know that it's a biography. And that's what I tried to do in the book. I didn't want to just write another sort of, you know, damning book. Or, you know, I wanted to give this sort of flair of these incredible stories. And I've got like hundreds of them. And um, and so anyway, that sparks the quality revolution, right? Like it literally sparks, it leads to like bad or good, lean Six Sigma. I mean, all this stuff literally comes out of that. Um, and then, you know, the thing I think I find most fascinating, he, from 19, it, so he's basically dormant from, from about like 1960 to, um, to 1980. He's literally an unknown. He's not really doing much. He's doing work, right? He's doing a, uh, Jura metrics, like statistics for, and then um, the documentary hits and everybody wants them. GM, Ford, um, Panasonic, uh, well, not Pan uh, Pfizer. I mean, just a list goes on and on. And he was actually at Park, you know. Um, and and so here's the thing that I think is the most fascinating about this man. Imagine you're 80 years old. Well, first of all, he's 50 when he starts the the miracle in Japan. Hmm. 80 when um he's 80 and for the next decade he does the most prolific work in his life non-stop i mean working with ceos of the largest corporations world revolutionizing the way uh, i even have a car a story of about a guy who was um involved in the earliest days of auto, auto, autonomous vehicles at gm you know like literally before there were autonomous vehicles right and like he tells the story how he worked with Deming. I got to interview these fascinating people. And um, and at 90, or basically his last book, in 93, he publishes a book called New Economics, and he basically creates his manifesto. So from 80 mm -hmm. to 93, he literally does the most significant work. Like at 80, I don't know if I'll be around at 80, but you know, <laughs> right. 80 to 93, and um, and he writes this book, New Economics, and he defines something which, again, this is the core of my book, it's called um, the system of profound knowledge. And, and and you know, I can get into that a little bit more about the book and all, but it's these sort of four. It's a lens to, to look at, like four sort of um, parameters of a lens to understand complexity. And and like that's the year he publishes the book. That year he dies, and it's it's his capstone so again and and, and there's just so many more stories of you know yeah. even like he he 
he wrote the um you didn't even talk about him he he wrote the the um the funeral song for his funeral mm. you know like he just like it's incredible like Amazing. again a full jump like character in our world you know so Right. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and and so what do you think if, you know, again, I, I know that we, we only have uh, so much time here, but if you were to, to uh, you know, point to a couple areas that uh, Dr. Deming, um, you know, was was uh, uh, used to, to find success with the work that he did in Japan, let's say, um, what would you point those to? I mean, I, I think about a, a couple things. Obviously, you know, he he was a data guy, and uh, um, data was an important piece for a lot of the you know, made, made sure that decisions were made based on data. Um, you know, are there any any other things that that you would point to and say, you know, this is why he had so much success with the work that was yeah. done in Japan? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, kind of quickly, the, 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 the system of found knowledge made up of these four parameters as a lens complexity. The first mm -hmm. is the theory of knowledge. And it's epistemology, it's scientific method, it's inductive reasoning, it even goes back to pragmatism. I cover the history of pragmatism in my book, even some like nerdy well guys who are brilliant that have these like incredibly terrible people. And, and But it, it is that sort of how do we know what we believe we know? Right, you know, sort of that inductive process, going all the way back to Francis Bacon. The second, you know, parameter is variation. This is the data part, analytical statistics. How do we analyze and understand what we know? The third mm. piece is psychology. How do we account for human behavior, motivation, mm. intrinsic motivation? You can already see, like a guy like you that oh. thinks very hard. Like this is incredible. Even adding that as a parameter, and the last is system thinking. So the so to. To put that in perspective of all of Japan, but certainly Toyota. So one of the first things that the Japanese started talking about is what they call the Deming Wheel, which actually started out with a guy named Dr. Shewitt, who was a mentor to Deming. And basically, that ultimately becomes uh, Plan, Do, Check, Act. And now we know it as Plan, Do, Study. And in fact, Deming renamed it to Plan, Do, Study, Act. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's basically theory of knowledge. Variation is the data part, right? Statistical, analytical statistics, statistical process control. Um, so, and and then uh, psychology, right? The human behavior. I would say in my book, I, I make the proposition that Deming learned more from the Japanese, and, and this ties to our trip and what we learned about their trust, mm -hmm. communication, collaboration. I think I've got enough evidence that when Deming went over there, he fell in love with that culture. And yeah. started seeing things. I, you know, my theory was he added that third parameter, primarily from his learnings in Japan, and then the fourth is system thinking, the mm -hmm. bigger picture. And if you remember when I asked Yoshino, so on that the trip, right? Yoshino, who's um, Oseo Yoshino in in Katie's wonderful book, right? Yes. Um, the um, I got to ask him. He hired uh, Toyota in 1966, right? Like he was just coming off the wave. Of the 50s and 60s right and and um i asked him of deming's impact to toyota and he said willie I'll, I'll boil it down to two things one he said he taught us to understand data as knowledge he taught the japanese he said and he taught us systems thinking now we know that like pds pdsa pdca was a big part of it and i would argue then that psychology was something he got from there seeing that intrinsic way of working and the human and Deming was a humanist if you if you can say anything about him he very much like you you know we were talking before the thing about your camp and all that you're a human you're a humanist like you care mm -hmm. about the human condition and that's another sort of compelling thread of this man he can he you know above all like you can use all his quotes all day long and people can play the the red bead game and all that stuff but at the end of the day he cared deeply about the human condition. So, yeah, I, I'd say three of those parameters he directly influenced, and we know that from Yoshino saying that. And um, and the psychology one is one he pulled back, which actually became his final manifesto, which was a system of profound knowledge. Mm, love it. I'm looking forward to uh, to your book coming out uh, and 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 being able to uh, dive into that. Um, can you give before we talk a little bit more about uh, our trip to Japan and, and some of the learnings there? 
Uh, can you tell our listeners the title, where will it be available, when will it be available yeah. uh, if they're interested? Yeah, it's called Deming's Journey to Profound Knowledge. It's uh, it's gonna it's published by IT Revolution. So the uh, the people who published Gene Kim's The Phoenix Project and my Dev and um, and uh, the uh, DevOps Handbook and I've got another book called Investments Unlimited. But yeah, it's so and August eighth. I, I mean, can't wait. It's been th- it's been ten years in waiting. It's three years serious working on it. And August eighth, less than a month. Like I know how wow. you must have felt. Like less than a month. You can order it online right now. It, it's it literally is out there on Amazon. The Kindle version. There's there's apparently um, for sort of larger scale publishers. There's um, a still a, a, a sort of delay in the supply chain of physical books. So um, so the physical book will come out in in January, but the Kindle mm-hmm. version is already up for sale on uh, on Amazon. Uh, again, Deming um, Deming's profound journey to. Uh, to profound knowledge and you know and I, you know one of the things I'll, I'll quickly say too is that one of the things i tried in the book doing the book is how did he come up with this thing at 93 where did he learn the theory of knowledge what were the things that sort of he picked up in his toolbox and i wanted to be clear that like he didn't invent this stuff so i distinguish between i talk more about profound knowledge than system of profound knowledge right and that profound knowledge is the sort of thing that is out in the universe and the other one thing, what most people hear somebody like this Demi guy, system of profound, wow, how arrogant. You, you got to understand the way he chose words. He chose that word in the abstract, not meaning that he was profound and that he was writing the profound stuff. He was saying the universe has profound knowledge. And he just tried, he spent a 70 year career, died at 93, in 93. Um, pulling that and galvanizing it and, and learning and understanding it and trying to put it in his last book is like, this is how you deal with complexity. Mm, powerful. And, and do you think uh, uh, Deming is still relevant today? Do you think things oh, that he said and did still matter today? I'm so glad you asked that question because the last third of my book is basically what would Deming do today? Mm. And I cover I cover exact stories of like a friend of mine, Josh Corman, who worked for Homeland Security. He supplied, he secured the supply chain for Operation Warp Speed. He, you know, I interviewed him. He's a friend of mine. He directly um, used Deming principles to supply, to, to secure software, cyber secure the supply chain. You know, like you need, you know, how do you get dry ice? You need petroleum. I mean, he literally went all the way back in the supply chain and specifically says his learnings from, Gene and I, and specifically Deming, there's a story about a company called Knight Capital that um, this is a fascinating story that it was a company where a sysadmin made, um, basically left out a comma in a very simplified explanation of something very common in, um, in a high frequency trading program that basically lost 445 million in 45 minutes. And they were out of business in 24 hours, second largest high frequency trading company, right? So I cover a lot of these stories of a, of hackers, hackers who got the FDA to recall. And I, I, I sort of trans, you know, Deming has this thing called the 14 points. So the last mm-hmm. chapter is I take all these facts. I've been in the cyber world for the last five or six years, DevSecOps, they call it. And so I, I took all these great stories, like the first, um, first litigated lawsuit for a denial of service in a hospital, right? Literally, you know, and I, I, I put it in the perspective of Deming's 14 points. How would he, and like, what if, you know, the executive order last year that came out, right? What if they, Deming was still alive and they brought him and said, Dr. Deming, how should we deal with this sort of, this very complex situation about cyber? And uh, in fact, if I had, if, if I had another year, I would have put in what he would be talking about is with the generative AI stuff though. But, mm, but yeah. right. so now the last third of the book is it, I heavily cover his thought. You know, I, I spent so much time understanding this man but I felt, and I know so much about DevOps, DevSecOps, and cyber. I, I, I felt comfortable enough to say, this is how he would think about how incidents and cyber and 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 sort of cyber terrorists and all those. And I used a lot of the known stories, you know, over the last you know five years. Hey everybody, this is Patrick. So sorry to interrupt this episode of the Lean Solutions podcast, but I have an important question: Are you tired of the old ways of doing business? feeling overwhelmed by inefficiencies and wasted resources. 
It's time to transform your approach and embrace the power of lean methodology. Welcome to our revolutionary Lean Solutions Academy with courses on lean methodology. Whether you're a seasoned executive or just starting out, our courses are designed to equip you with the knowledge and skills that you need to streamline your operations and maximize your success. Our courses are packed with actionable strategies and real world examples to help you apply lean principles to your own business. You'll learn how to optimize your workflows, reduce lead times, and deliver value to your customers more efficiently. From value stream mapping to 5S methodology, Six Sigma courses, Lean Six Sigma Yellow Belt, Lean Six Sigma Green Belt, Lean Six Sigma Black Belt, we cover all the essential tools and techniques used in Lean. You'll gain a deep understanding of waste identification, continuous improvement, and problem solving methodologies. Our online platform allows you the flexibility to learn at your own pace from anywhere in the world. With high quality video lessons, interactive quizzes, and downloadable resources, you'll have everything that you need to succeed. By enrolling in our Lean courses, you gain a competitive edge, increasing your operational efficiency and unlocking your business's true potential. Join the ranks of successful change agents who have embraced Lean and revolutionized their organizations. Enroll today and you'll get $100 off your first course, which practically pays for any of our e-learning courses. We want to make it so easy for you to jumpstart your lean journey. Don't miss out on this incredible offer. Visit our website now and claim your discount at www.findleansolutions.com forward slash academy. Now, back to the show. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's that that that's uh I'll, I'm interested to see how you overlap those and, and bring those together. That'll, that'll be exciting to, to read about. Um, so so uh, what we'll do is um, we'll, we'll drop a link to your book in the show notes. And that way, if anyone's interested who's listening in, you can go right to the show notes, find a link to John's book there and, and be able to uh, purchase the Kindle version or obviously you know, wait for the, the, the paperback. Uh, John, let's talk a little bit about our trip to Japan. You already brought up Mr. Yoshino, um, who was with us in Japan, uh, which was amazing to hear from him. Yeah. Uh, but you were very, you had a, a, a mission while you were there and, and well, obviously you were there to learn you were, you, but I could tell that you were also doing a little bit of your own research for your book. Um, and so you were asking those questions about Dr. Deming, uh, and, you know, um, Mr. Nomoto as well, which, uh, you know, there was some interesting conversations that came out of that. So can you just uh, uh, give us a kind of an overview of how those conversations went uh, with Mr. Yoshino and, and how that the, the topics that were discussed and talked about and how that then uh, obviously added to the, the your book and, and added to the, some value that, that's offered through that? It's funny, you know, how like arrogance can play a part, even though we like we, we try really hard not to. To, like be perceived as arrogant people right like but like sometimes like the way we're treated and you know and you know and i know you know you're sort of very well known in your space i'm very well and, and it creeps in and i remember meeting glenn and you know i knew glenn wilson who was on the trip and he said have you read this book and and it, usually when there's something the one thing i love about the book buying patterns today is like if, if me and you were together and you say you should read this book i like order it right there on my phone right like right. that's <laughs> the, the, the tier one publishers don't get this right but um but then um so i, I ordered it right away and and um and he said well i'm i'm gonna go on this japan study trip and i thought you know did i really learn anything and you know, it was a little pricey right and and so my arrogance sort of kicked in right like the, you know and but i read the book and then i was like oh my god this is an incredible book in fact one of the things i say to people uh, about you know, and no disrespect to all the lean people listening. <laughs> so it's just coming from a non-lean person. So like, except that I say that you know, if you really want to cut to the chase, there's three books you should read, uh, or you should say two books you should read, and then it'll cover most of the, the fair ground that you need, which is Mike Rothfuss' Torticata, and then read Steven Spears' High Velocity Edge, and then you'll have like that'll save you reading 30 books. I would add your book now and there. But then I said, like when I read Katie's, I'm like, oh, this is the third book. Yeah. The third book you should now read these three books you know what i mean glenn i'm talking about that and um so I, I love that book and you know i said you know and my wife said to me you know you work so hard you know you deserve to go ahead and do yourself i didn't 
like I didn't know what I was like. I, I knew she was fascinating. I, you know, I saw that me and Glenn were the only sort of IT people or DevOps people. And I thought, wow, just meeting other people with the same interests could be bad. Yes, yeah, so it all added up. I still didn't have, I had no idea. Yeah. So, yes, I said, all right, I'm going to go there and learn about Demi. I'm going to learn about Japan, you know, uh, Namato, because I loved her quote, in, you know, from Yoshino said that Namato was as important as Ono, in some cases more. And then I read Namato's book before I went there, right? And so those are, that, that was my mission. But, oh, my God, like I got, you know, exponentially more knowledge from oh, yeah. the, the visits and the companies and the, you know, the, the, the see this sort of, I, I said to Glenn that, you know, if I didn't know better and I do know better. So like if Katie, if you're listening, I like, I would say if I didn't know better, I would say she choreographed a fictional story. It was so <laughs> that every company, like, you'd almost like, Oh, come on, man. Did she not set this up with it? And I know she didn't. Right. And, and like each company was like, Oh my God, that's the same thing we heard yesterday. And even down to the last day. Um, so all of that, and I've, I've written a bunch of podcasts on it. If you can put my profound-damming.com, uh, it's a low budget, uh, uh, blog, but I always say, uh, content's better than quality. Right. But, uh, the, oh, yeah. um, but, but, but yeah, I, I think for me, that it was be able to talk to you, I, I, I still think even more to, to your question, I thought the biggest takeaway was going to be learning about the motto from Yoshino hearing his thoughts about damning, that was not the biggest takeaway for me. The biggest mm. takeaway was that consistency of, from, you know, each supplier we went to and ending with the Tessia bullet train cleaning company, like just, oh my God, like it was the final Gemba. So yeah, that, right. that, um, I, I got way more out of it and even more than I thought, which was, but I did get a lot about like confirmation about how, who Namato was, why he was, why Yoshino thought he was so important and what was Deming's input on directly on Toyota. Yeah. And and again, for those that are listening that may not know who Mr. Namato is, uh, can you just uh, maybe give a brief, brief uh, summary of who he is and what Mr. Yoshino said about him? Yeah, you know, what's interesting is, um, you know, I, I you know, I've, I've studied a fair amount of work about um, about Ono, right? We all have, right? Like you sort of, you know, one on one reading if you're going to be in the lean game, right? And um, and I thought, you know, that um, the interesting thing about uh, Ono is about sort of workflow, just in time waste, right? And we say, okay, that's Toyota. And we have like discussions um, all about that and Ono's impact. Well, there was a lot more to it. It was that soft side. By the way, Namato was the first guy, not be the first guy in Toyota, the first individual to win the Deming Prize. Hmm. He was directly influenced by Ishikawa, and Ishikawa was part of the, a direct influence. He was the pr first president of Juice. Deming's the one who got, you know, the uh, Japanese Union of Scientists and Engineers. Um, so uh, the motto is like, and, and here's the thing. If you read the motto's book, you know, there's the famous quote by Ono, like, uh, you know, and I shorten it to no problem is problem. Mm -hmm. Right. Like what I, I kind of like, it, there's no Namato quote that says this. But it's like literally, I made this up after I read the book. No complaint is complaint. Hmm. So he gets into like the service side, the human side, and so and if you think of the power of what we think about a lean, yeah, waste is important, flow is important, and just in time is important. But so is the sort of human, the culture, the motivation. And if you read Namato's book, um. It's all about his 10 principles and it, and you can see how Toyota without that, I don't think you have this, you know, with, you don't have the success of Toyota and he's never talked about. And the first time I heard his name was in Katie's book mm. when Yoshino said he's as important, possibly more important than Ono. Mm. Powerful. Yeah. He it, it definitely uh, someone you don't want to pass up for sure. Um, and, and, and what what would you say, uh, uh, you know, anything specifically that Mr. Yoshino said about him that during our trip that you think is worth sharing with the, with the listeners? Well, I think, that, you know, it's funny, you know, because you had that translation problem, right? And that probably is what it was, right? And getting mm -hmm. 
I, you know, I think you, you were, me and you were, were probably asking the most questions and on the, um, you know, like if you counted up all the questions, we were close to even and probably the next one was the, <laughs> if you grafted a little dip, right? And, um, you know, and me and you were cool because we didn't want to hog. So we'd wait. Like, I, like, I loved it. You did. I wasn't as vocal at it, but you'd say, if nobody else can ask questions, I'm going to ask questions. Right? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's I was the way I, learn, man. <laughs> yeah, because you don't want to be the guy that's just constantly hogging the questions. So right. You sit and wait and wait and say, you know, wait a minute. I'm here to learn. If you're not going to ask any questions, so uh, but the, the, I I realized I don't know if you got this. At some point, you had to be very crafty about your question because you spent a lot of time in the interpreter trying to figure out what you meant and then trying to explain it to them and then sort of getting a curt yes or no answer, right? So um, so I didn't get as much about the motto other than confirmation. But to be honest with sure. you, most of what I got about the motto, um, which was and I like was in Katie's book about mm -hmm. the host and canary. Right. Uh, like that, you know, like the, this is the guy that literally created the management focus of host and canary. And it, I just didn't feel like those questions were going to be able to unless I could do a one on one with them. Like there was sure. no way on a bus ride I was going to be, uh, you know. Can you interpret or explain my question about hosting canary and the impact of it for managers from the motto? Like that wasn't going to work, you know? So, yeah, yeah, no, it makes sense. Uh, and, and you mentioned a few uh, parts of the trip, uh, you know, what would you say was your favorite? I mean, can you, could you point to one thing that you would say was, was the number one top uh, learning point or the, the best part of the trip that, that, yeah. you know, you would say is, was the most added, added the most value for you? Yeah, I, I think I would, you know, my first cop out answer would be all of it, right? Okay, that, you know, that's a cop out answer. But yeah. and then I would say my second cop out is, can I get two? And and <laughs> if I if you said no, I'd say it was the bullet train, the cleaning company. Yeah. But all, mainly because everything that led to that was the culmination. But the thing that probably I started thinking about, I wasn't, it, I wasn't weirdly as impressed about the the the, the um, grammar school visit as everybody else was while we were there sure but it wasn't until i got home and i came to this conclusion that like sorry again everybody in the lean community but this includes devops community includes you know digital transformation you know, in some ways we're doomed because when you see that they get that immersive culture that you know the the the, the short story was we went to the elementary school the kids served you know, lunch to the other kids in rotation, served it to the teachers. They cleaned the place. They didn't have janitors. They actually understood the concept of Kaizen. What are they, five or six-year-olds, seven-year-olds? And and I'm thinking, well, you know, we have to sort of break the mold of an institutionalized, Tayloristic, you know, um, you know, model that is very extrinsic at its core. And these kids are coming up with a pure collaborative community the other thing was community we just heard community over and how it was so intertwined and and i thought you know for a minute like again i'm not going to stop trying to help people learn but but for a minute i thought you know like no wonder why it's so hard for us mm. you know right i mean that that that, that that what how those kids come out and then we were told that all element even though it was a private school all elementary schools have this same practice right like i mean that's like, and, and that's the thing going back to Deming, like he saw that culture, you know, with, with no clothes, right? The, like he saw the, he, he, he literally, like there's a, one of his secretary, his only major secretary wrote a sort of anthology of all his events and uh, the Cecil Kill, Killian, Killian, I think. And, and it's like all, like the first time he went there, the first time he had Saki, the first time he saw Kabuki theater, like you could see his incredible, in, like knowledge, like give me more. I want to know more. I want to understand these people, and and you know again it was the but the bullet train was the like I think it was the final um, you know, watching that cleaning copy all the behaviors that they had about the sort of respect and you know um, yeah it was just um, that was incredible and the the school after I got home and I started thinking about like how hard it is for us to, ch to create change here and why it was like, why something like Deming's ideas of like system thinking and, and epistemology and like just it created this monster, if you will. Steven Spears mm -hmm. said, has a presentation 
where he talks about he shows like uh, Godzilla, and he says that you know let, let me make clear, Ford had decimated General Motors, and uh, and Ford you know during the uh, you know sort of the eight the eighties, I mean it was just pure. I would say there's been nothing like it in modern commerce of what Toyota did to the American economy. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. They definitely uh, surpassed during that time uh, for sure. So John, uh, uh, obviously um, looking forward to reading your book. Uh, you know, I think about the, just knowing you, our discussions in Japan, I mean, in the past 40 years, you've written 11 books, you've built 12 startups, three successful exits. Uh, what's next for John? What, what do you, what, yeah. I mean, you, you wrote about Deming and, you know, you, we talked earlier about him at 80, 90 years old. I mean, what, what do you got uh, planned for the future? I mean, you know, the, there go for the grace of God, I live to be 90, but, um, but um <laughs> So one of the things that was, you know, it's funny when I wrote the first um, draft of the book, like it was like 400 pages. And and one of my best friends, who's another, he was another target reader. He, you know, he's the only guy I know that read end to end Ulysses and, and Gravity's Rainbow and understood him. Right. Like like he is an intellectual reader and he taught like an older brother. He just like, what are you doing? How come you're telling this story? What is so I had to cut out like 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 30 amazing stories, you know, out of the book. And then I realized, oh, I'm just going to publish that as an anthology. So that's something I'm going to have by the end of the year, which is all these like amazing stories that just, it just sort of corrupted the narrative. Like that every long away, they'd say, you know, uh, you know, John, like my last story was Deming's wife created woman sizing. Hmm. So I had a chapter called uh, The Devil Wears Prada, where I talk <laughs> about how. And and like it broke my heart. And I'm sure when you wrote your book, there were things like, no, please don't take that one. But yeah. uh, what I realized is I'm putting in a companion. Um, so I've got that. Um, you know, I'm thinking about a Deming handbook. Um, and then um, I crazy enough, I, I've got a, a couple of friends who um, who want to invest. I, I've been really going deep into the generative AI and and you know how do you how to use it in a way that could really enhance the way we do practice. You know, my, my career has been operations, Yeah. you know, IT operations, you know, mm -hmm. that's what I do. I've been doing it for since 1980, right? Like working in monster companies, helping them automate infrastructure, installs software, basically what we call DevOps today. I think there's an incredible opportunity to, um, to corral, these powerful engines to help us understand how to do things like incident management and, and, um, you know, sort of cyber risk control, risk management. So there's a possibility that I might actually do. And I keep saying I'm done with startups, you know, like I'm 64, like, come on, John, like, when are you going to stop doing this? But it's in my blood. So I, I, there's a chance I might actually, I'm, I'm doing a lot of research on generative AI and the enterprise. Like, how can you take Jira tickets? How can you take Confluence? How can you take all this stuff and use it to make, you know, I figured out how to, to solve the hallucination problem. And, and that's just doing research of other people who figured that out. So I've, I've really minimized the code's called retrieval augmentation. And so with that now, and then I can isolate the information so it doesn't go out in the public. And, and when you can do those two things, then these things become incredibly powerful tools for what we do. So. Mm. Powerful. Do you yeah. think one last question, uh, just based on what you just said, uh, how do you think AI is going to change uh, the future for companies uh, and, and maybe even specifically tied to continuous improvement? I mean, what do you see? What do you see based on some of the research that you're doing? Yeah, I think it like I mean, I so one of the articles I want to write now is, you know, I, I, I often talk a guy named Jay Bloom, if you just Google him. He's probably the smartest guy. I worked with him at Red Hat. He's just incredibly brilliant. Um, you know, he kind of taught me, gave me this idea of like comparing the um, industrial economies to knowledge economies, right? Instead of talking about industrial engineering or industrial, um, you know, um, whatever improvement or like like think about them as economies, right? And and I think that. Um, the idea that like everything we've done, like so the, the industrial economy, like we understand, it's pretty, you know, like it's a lot of what you do. Like we have that, 
pretty well down. I mean, there's still a lot of like, how do we get change? How do we be more like, you know, what Toyota did or, but, but like, like we've got that solid. We thought like cloud computing and DevOps and all these things were sort of the pinnacle of the knowledge economy. They're not. This new generation is the next, um, is, is I think the beginning of like, if we said TPS or Toyota production system was the sort of the, the sort of avant-garde, the poster child for industrial economy, I think we're at the beginning of that shaping now. Um, and so, um, so everything changes. I think, you know, unfortunately, and people are not going to react well to this, that, you know, um, you're going to see um, massive, we're already seeing like um, PR departments and marketing just getting sliced because the, the net net and even coding, you know, that when Goldman Sachs, if you went back and don't quote me, you went back like 15 or 20 years or Goldman Sachs probably had, you know, 3000 tra day traders. They got less than a hundred now. It's mm -hmm. all algor trading. That's going to happen to programmers. Now, what's going to happen is people like you, me, and and I've been doing, like, I haven't coded in 10 years. And in the last month, I've been coding Python like a maniac. And if you know what you're doing, like, you can make fun of Copilot and all these tools. But if you know how to code, these tools are incredible. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I know, like, I'm just going to get a little technical, that a JSON object gets returned from a search API, a Google search API, and I need to get the fourth level nested field. Like, I know yeah. how to ask that question. If you've never programmed, you don't know how to ask that question, right? right. And so this is the key. It's going to eliminate the people like you, me, and, 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 and I'm sure many of your listeners, if you embrace it, like the subject matter expert, the human is going to be a critical piece. So all this nonsense about it's going right. to replace the human, it's going to change. It's going to change, right. It's just like, you know, um, you know, like the the um, the sewing and seamstress and like the, those all just changed, right? But your knowledge, so the people who embrace this and knowledge, and and there's something called one. You know, I know I, I chat pretty much, and you're probably like, my God, how am I going to get this guy off here? But but um, there's <laughs> no, a not called, at all. There's a thing called Jevons paradox, and 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 in a non-scientific, non-academic way, the explanation is the more abstractions you create the more it creates more sort of um, things, if you will, a non word. And, and, and almost every example in history or modern history of when we think that something is going to uh, reduce, it actually increases. And I'll give you an example, like um, videos for movie theaters. You know, like the, like we thought, oh, my God, that's going to destroy. Like actually, the movie theaters, you know, until the COVID thing, basically, was like, 24 plex 36 plex right when we thought with the uh, dvds and videos we're going to put them out of business right so that's that's an example of a jevons paradox and so my i think there's a possibility you have to be willing to your point earlier though john not to interrupt you but you have to be willing yeah. to change with with the times to your point you know you think about let's let's talk about blockbuster right i mean blockbuster didn't didn't change with the times and they thought they they would just you know improve their the, their walk-up desk and make, make that better for customers. And they weren't even thinking about uh, what, you know, Redbox was going to do to them. Uh, you know, obviously we all know now looking back, but um, I think for all of us, to your point, embracing the, you know, the, the, what AI is doing and learning as much as we can yeah. Yeah. and figuring out how do we come alongside this and we may have, our businesses may have to change. They will have to change. Yeah. I mean, the, the technology is going to change everything. So it, it has already and it is continuing to. So you can't more, let, you can't yeah, let right. technology pin you, right? Like, you know, I, I, I get a kick at nowadays if I go to a DevOps conference, you know, I'm working with like 25 year old kids, right? And and they'll say, you know, you know, I, like they read my bio and they see that I, I started out as an IBM mainframe assembler coder. That was like my first real job, like in 1980, right? And they're like, you know, my grandfather did that, you know, and like, and I've had four five solid different careers since then, right? Like, so, I, and I'm not saying I'm special, but you have to be able to see a change. And then you can make that decision to just, you know, and then, you know, I have friends that like my age that have retired, stayed at one job, did great, you know, they, they did fine. There's, I got nothing against that, 
But like, if you're a coal miner, you better go to night school. You know, like that's a that's a message twenty years ago, <laughs> not right. now, right? Like, but it's the analogy of, uh, you know, and and again, the confidence is if it, like people like you and people who are gonna like take the time to listen to this show are more likely to be the kind of people that are, and, and and sort of my advice, like if you take any advice from me, don't you know the hype works two ways. There's the hype of like, oh my God, is gonna do everything. All you know, the people who sort of run around like, you must drop everything, you must do this, right? And they're they're nonsense. But the hype of the really smart people who say that yeah, that's terrible, that will never work. Don't fall into that hype either. Get right in the middle and figure it out. Just because right. somebody you know who is brilliant, I've got some brilliant friends that are just be, like they they send me DMs and and uh, little chats and say, why are you going nuts on this nonsense? You know, and I'm like, you know, like I'm learning. You know, so don't right. let the negative, you know, hype or sort of anti-hype, um, you know, and, and it'll be some of your best friends, too, who will basically tell you, like, you almost be embarrassed to uh, to admit that you're doing it because, you know, like four of your friends are going to, like, jump on you. Right. Well, sure. that, that's a trap. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John, John, it's been great to have you on. Obviously, we could we could continue on probably forever uh, with with the good conversation. If anyone's interested to reach out to you with questions or anything, where would be the best place for them to go to to connect with you? Yeah, this is something marketing one on one. I failed, so um, I I picked a, t a word called botchikabulu botchikabulu b o t c. You can put it in b o t c h a g a l u p e. And it's at Gmail or it's my Twitter handle and um, or, you know, or John Willis. You know, I'm pretty easy to find on LinkedIn. Right. It's John Willis. Perfect. Somebody already had John Willis. So John Willis, Atlanta. I'm not even in Atlanta anymore. But uh, but, you know, you can tell pretty quickly who who I am. So those are probably the the best, two. And then if you, you know, sort of interested in the stuff that profound dash deming dot com is where I sort of try to put as many blog articles and interviews. And I have a podcast called Profound as well so i'm not you know still i'm not you know i'm not as professional i just sort of i i mean i asked you like how do you have so many followers on linkedin and you gave me a very prescriptive like john i do this and i still haven't i'm still such a knucklehead i haven't followed your advice so but eventually <laughs> No worries. No worries. Well, we'll put all those, uh, all, all that contact uh, information, your website, your LinkedIn, uh, we'll put all that into uh, uh, the show notes. So if anyone's interested to reach out to John, you can find his contact information right in the show notes. John, again, it's been amazing to have you on. It was great to, to meet you in Japan and get to know you. Looking forward to your upcoming book, uh, all the amazing things that, that you're doing. Uh, and maybe later this year, we'll have you back on the show and we can talk about how the how the book launch went and and everything, uh, you know, after the book's been out. So and then I'd love to get you on my my show is not as sort of popular, but I, I'd love for the DevOps community. I loved your book, as I said before the show, I read it on the trip home from Japan, couldn't put it down. And uh, I would love to get, you know, sort of interview you about like some of the really cool things I took notes in your book on my uh my thing and get that out to the deming uh, the De devops community so you bet yeah. love right. it let's do it all right, all right, my all right. thanks Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Lean Solutions Podcast. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to subscribe. This way you'll get updates as new episodes become available. If you feel so inclined, please give us a review. Thank you so much.